So you just, if you have a belief, you have an idea, you have something, just do it. You know, just like keep on doing it, keep on trying. You hit many roadblocks. That's why people will say no, no, tell you all sorts of things, but you know what you want, right? So you just keep keep going. Hello guys, you're welcome to the Minority Report Nigeria. I am Chidozi and I'm Walter. And today we are sitting with Pamela Adi, who has done a lot of things, but particularly most recently um, produced a documentary about her life and her journey titled On That the Wind. So oh, welcome yeah. Pamela. Thank you. Um, can you for the uninitiated, can you tell us a bit about yourself and this documentary? Just a bit. Wow, I don't, I don't know that I should be talking about myself now, but um, but the documentary pretty much is um, just using my journey of self discovery um, to shine light on um, lesbian stories in Nigeria, um, and you know those stories are usually not centered or not like the focus of or not even included in the mm -hmm. conversations on. On, in the LGBT rights conversations in Nigeria, or even in the conversations around equal rights. Um, so I decided to make the film because we felt, as I said, that those stories are not centered and they're not enough. So I just wanted to add to the narrative. There was one time my mom went out and came back and said, she had gone to see a prophetess and the prophetess told her that I was under attack. Her whole family was under attack. So she, she brought a, a, a gallon of some substance and it looked like, to me, it looked like gutter water. You recall that I was still married at the time I came out of the closet. So it was a very difficult time. Um, for the whole of 2011, you know, I was pretty much um, suffering from depression. It was the most depressing and the lowest point of my whole life. You know, I, I told my, called my mom, my dad, I said, Mom, Dad, I have something I need to talk about. I need to tell you. So I, I, I sat them down and I remember telling my, actually, I, I told my dad, I said, you know, dad, I told him I'm not attracted to men. And he said, wow, then are you attracted to women? And, he's, and I said, yes. Before we go, let me just say how much I loved the documentary. And one of the things that was most amazing about it for me was how it was very besides the fact that it was very well shot and very well done is how you know it's centered on your life and the ways in which you know your story um can be representative of those of others was ancillary it wasn't really the focus it was that you know calm assertiveness um in telling your story with that knowledge that your story mattered that was you know really really beautiful for me and that was well, one of the you know biggest things I took away from it, and also for me personally, it was almost like you know um, uh, a call to action because this is like the first of many stories you have told your story now, and we have seen this. So th there's room for a lot more of these sort of stories and conversations. But you know, I am also curious why um, did you choose the medium of film and a documentary particularly? So I've always believed that um, visual storytelling is more powerful. Um, not, not that other means of story, storytelling are not powerful, like writing or, you know, or radio, or like, I mean, audio or whatever. But I've always believed that when you put a face to a story, 
it I, in my opinion I think that it's a it's a game changer I mean um, I've also written I, I, I have a blog with, where I write about my experiences and everything but it just never felt like it was enough I, I always felt like I could reach more people if I did a film if I did a documentary um, it not only is just talking about or having people talk about it but having me me personally talk about it so you're not just reading this thing from some person who's who's written it you're actually seeing the person like live right it is so different when you're talking about something in the abstract you know but when you put a face to it it's a whole different ball game and so i think that that is very powerful and so that's really why i chose that medium um, about um, in, in, in the documentary, there were places um, that were, that, you, know, you mentioned um, about the parts where you walked with all out, and I thought that was um, there was a sense of very deep satisfaction. I, I mean, I, I remember um, the, the when you mentioned uh, the, the victory, the win you had when you were able to stop Stephen um, Anderson. Yes, yeah. a very homophobic man from getting into South Africa and from really just having the kind of access that he was looking for all over Africa. I felt very, very satisfied by that. And I just, I wanted to know just how important was it to you to be able to make this strike, to, to be able to achieve this kind of um, win you know, for the community in Africa. Well, I mean, it was it was so important to me that I I I, <laughs> I had to uh, spend a lot of my time. Um, I had just joined All Out actually about uh, I was only about two months into the job when the story broke, and I was like, man, we can't we can't, we can't <laughs> let this guy just come. I mean, it's okay that he's doing it in America and everything, but we can't just make him we can't just allow him to just come to Nigeria and to Africa and just like, you know, and we already know that our South Africa is already a very um, homophobic society, yeah. even though their laws, uh, they, they have uh, they have protection uh, for LGBT people mm -hmm. in their laws, but society still, I mean, lesbians are still raped, you know, yeah. you still have high cases of what they call correction rape, yeah. right? And so I, I felt that him going would just add to the, to the fire yes. and would make it even more, make South Africa an even more dangerous place, you know, make it worse for the, for the community. And so I took it upon myself to try to say, okay, let this, let's see what we can do. Let's talk to the government and let's see, you know. So we found a local partner in South Africa worked together, drafted everything, and then of, of course the guy ended up being like two two or three days before his arrival also he ended up being declared an undesirable person. And then you know he went to but he went to Botswana they now kicked him out. <laughs> you know and then the UK banned him also. Oh. Canada banned him also. <laughs> And I think recently, uh, I, I've forgotten which country, but another country also recently uh, has banned him from entry. Great. So, you know, so I, I think that for me, what that taught me was that we should never like underestimate our power. You know, sometimes we dismiss things because maybe we feel it won't work or... Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah, because, sorry, I just, did you anticipate this? Like, domino effect. Yes, this kind of sweeping the wing. Like no, I I didn't. I you know I was so focused on on the African continent. In fact, <laughs> even when he even when he got to to um, to Botswana, you know, we were trying to um, uh, start up another thing, but it was too close. You know, the time there wasn't enough time for us to do that. So, but we we now rallied other people other activists in the community in Botswana and of course they had already heard about what happened in South Africa. South Africa. So in fact they arrested him when he was doing a, 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 a he, he was on a radio show. Yes. They went to the radio station and arrested him 
and took him to the airport and flew him back. <laughs> so I know I didn't I didn't I didn't anticipate it, but it was very good news because it means in fact he after this whole thing happened, he even made a video on on Facebook and he was talking about how he was just at the airport when the airline called his name and when he went to the counter he said sorry you cannot fly with us because the UK has banned you and we are going to the UK. So that means you can't enter the UK at all. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, I I, I did not expect it but I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know it started with just <laughs> you thinking, you know, okay, you know what, we should do something like that. I just I thought there was like this whole big machinery behind no, there wasn't. You know, there wasn't. It was a small <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, back to the documentary, there was something you know that really struck me. Um, we have this sense of coming out usually, you know, as being this performative thing. You, you know, you are coming out to street people all the time. But but then, you know, um, by account in your documentary, the moment um, the 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 watershed moment for you was when you came out to yourself. And it was a very uneventful thing. You were lying down, looking at this thing, and then it just came to you, I am a lesbian. Right. And then that was when everything just started to fall into place. Exactly. And for me, I just had to think about, you know, um, that focus on coming out as performance as opposed to, you know, coming out to yourself. And then, because I then realized that when you come out to yourself, right, um, the, everything else becomes inevitable. It might not happen immediately. It might not be easier, but it then becomes inevitable, right? So I was wondering, you know, if how you saw, you know, in, in light of your experience, how you saw or how you see um, the emphasis, how how how, how I'm not just lay emphasis when it comes to coming out, you know, in terms of like coming out to straight people and you know the, that whole environment, really. performance of it. Well, I can only speak from my experience yeah, and sure, why I did what I did. Um, so I do what I did. I came out because I wanted to want be free to be myself, right? And as you said, my coming out to myself was very uneventful in a very in the very oddest of, of circumstances, right? Um, and I, again, I think that that, as you said, was the time when everything began to fit, and I began to understand. Okay. <laughs> Ah, she. <laughs> yeah, you understand. So for me, it was that. So that's that's a different thing. But um, in terms of people coming out and it being a perform, I don't honestly. I don't really think that people coming out is performative. I think that. Well, this is my opinion. I think mean, it might be wrong, it might be right, and this is based on my own experience, experience yeah. right? I, I came out because I wanted to be free, because I wanted to, I wanted my family and my friends to know me for who I was, or for who I am, right? I didn't want them to, I didn't, I didn't want to be one person online and then be a different person into my family or with my friends or in public, you know, I wanted everybody to just sort of no, at the same time, so I don't have to explain anything. Did you just yeah. like, uh, hey. so it was really to free myself more than anything else. You talked about in the documentary about um, your sister actually printing the coming out, telling your parents before you did, and um, how you resented you know, when it came out that she had already told your parents before you did, like you resented her for it. And I drew that parallel with my experience with my brother. When so like he told my parents just when he knew and he confronted me with it and we were having an argument, you know, and I was I think it was that conversation with him that made me realize actually you're ready to come out, you know, because the more he was talking and talking, the more relaxed I was about mm -hmm. him knowing. I wasn't terrified. And then when he now said when he now made some comments that hinted at there was this veil trend that he would tell our parents, you know, and I, in my mind, I was like, well, sure, go ahead, do that. I mean, it would be easier for me, like, if you tell them to prepare the way for me, it would be like, I mean, if anything happens, like, you give them a heart attack or something, <laughs> so, but I want to know, like, did you, 
why was it resentment? Like, why at no point did you feel like she did you a favor or something like that? I mean, why did you feel like it was your sole responsibility and therefore she had no right to step in and do that for you? Well, number one, because I didn't ask her to. <laughs> so, okay. that's number one. Um, two, because nobody can tell your story more than you. And I don't think that it is our place to tell the stories of other people when they have not given us permission to. Of you understand? So, I wanted to... I mean, I wasn't there when she was saying whatever she said. I don't know what she said, like how she said it, okay. right? But um, I wanted to be the one to say it because I, I felt like they should hear from me directly. And that's one of the reasons why I came out. I, that I came out to them directly. I didn't want them to hear it from a blog or from somebody, a friend or somewhere else, you know. I wanted them to hear it directly from me because I felt that I was in the best position to talk about it. Okay. So you used to be married? Mm-hmm. To a man? Yes. That was, uh, you know, for me, when, when I was watching the documentary, and, you know, you talk, talk about your marriage and everything. It was striking for me because um, you described yourself as a child that was very strong-willed growing up. You know, somebody who had a very, you know, good sense of who she was. And just made me think about you know, just the tremendous amount of pressure that, you know, same sex people are under, you know, by society. So much so that, you know, from your story and everything, that commitment to um, this sort of um, self delusion, right? This aspiration, uh, um, this heterosexuality as aspiration, that commitment to that ideal, you know, so much so that we do things that. We really do not want, and you know, from your story, it seemed like the condition of that was your marriage. So I'm really curious, how exactly did that happen in terms of you know where you were, your state of mind before the marriage, and what prompted? Because um, obviously, you came into your full knowledge of self while you were in the marriage. You know what that journey was like from the girl who was ready to go, you know, along with this marriage, even though it wasn't, it wasn't something you wanted. And the self-actualized one who, you know, was like, okay, this is not for me. So, you know, this this thing of um, social integration is real, yeah. you know. And it also, what what was happening for me was, I was more, I was, I, I like to say to myself, or I like to tell people that at that time I wasn't really thinking about i wasn't having deep thoughts about my life at that time i was doing more what i thought was expected right so okay i finished school we had done all of these things it's like yeah so the next thing right and then we're all like expected to get married and then you have a family for women and then that's the end of your life and then the man who you marry you know Will be the one to go on and do achieve all his dreams, yeah. And for you, your own has stopped at be getting married, having yeah, the neck, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, um, for me, I, I think that getting married and having been in that, having found myself in that situation was a wake up call for me, you know. Um, because I mean, I was 25. I thought I knew everything. I thought I knew myself. You know, I thought, I, you know, you understand, like, you can do this. But then, um, clearly, that wasn't the case, right? And so I had to. And again, that's what you know led to all the other things that happened. I don't want to give away too much of the film yeah, now to yeah, help people to yeah. watch it, but but then that led to like all the other things that that, that happened. But I think that if I didn't. I don't think that if I had not gotten married, I would be where I am now. You understand? Mm -hmm. And I think that yeah, the marriage was a necessary step. It was a necessary event, and it helped me to get to where I am now. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, okay, but 
there's something, I mean, not to give away anything, but the parts where um, you during your courtship, you made you mentioned that you were not present for most of it, and you felt more um, like bothered by him, and you looked for excuses to not be with him, even though it was just natural for you to get to know him, the man you get to know him too. And I, I wanted to understand, like, at that point, was this hesitation or this pullback, was it because you knew you were starting to, I, you, were, you were starting to know yourself and know that this wasn't for you? I wanted to understand what you may, you may have been thinking at that moment or what may have been guiding your actions by at that time. So I wasn't really thinking and um, and, and also um, I think that all of this realization of me avoiding spending time with him happened, happened in retrospect. Okay. So it, it wasn't conscious. So I wasn't mm -hmm. like consciously, I wasn't saying, man, I just get Oh, now call me now. Do you understand? Yeah. But subconsciously, I was looking for things to do to avoid yeah. all of that. You understand? So, yeah. so, so me, the, the things that I talk about in the documentary, I'm talking about them in retrospect. Yeah. Usually, when we talk about, um, you know, same sex loving people who wind up, you know, married to. You know, um, opposite sex loving people, which is the my new favorite term. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, well, you know, when we talk about um, those sort of relationships, we tend to stress, you know, it's the fault of society, the influence of society, but something else, and there were many things that were really, really shocking about this documentary, everybody needs to watch it, was, um, you know, you talked about feeling guilty and, you know, taking. Um, some level of responsibility for what you know for, um, for for the marriage. So it wasn't just, and I think that 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 was really beautiful because it was it wasn't just um, society happened to me, right? And it showed that particular word for me was um, showed a great deal of maturity. You taking responsibility for whatever role you played in you know um, enabling this farce, so to speak. So in terms of that, you know. Um, what generally would you, do you think um, about the rhetoric that um, gay people only end up in relationships with heterosexual people or marriages with heterosexual people because it's society and that, you know, um, they, uh, yeah, they, 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 gay people have no role in it. It's just if society didn't da 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 da, then this would just wouldn't be having these relationships. Well, you know, I've always said that. Um, it's easier to lay blame on others than to lay blame on yourself. Um, so for me, um, I always say that in anything that goes wrong or goes right, you have the part to play in it as long as you were part of it, right? So whether it is by your action or your inaction or misaction, whatever, you know, there's always something there's always something that you could have done differently or that you could have not done or you know yeah. so i don't really the idea that things just happen or, or that or that the way other people make choices based on what society has told them to do is one that I, I don't really agree with because I believe that at every point in time, no matter the circumstances, you are, there's always a, a choice. And so it's one thing to say, given the situation that I was in, this is the choice I made and I feel bad about it. It's another thing to say, no, it wasn't my fault, too. it's because of society. You Something know. different. Yeah. Things. Yeah, so even like as a society, you know, as in, in general, the way we are, the way we are socialized, we tend to have what I, what sociologists call locus of control. Yeah. So if, if you have an internal locus of control, you take responsibility for okay. your actions, for what happens in your life. 
if you have an external locus of control, then you use phrases like who they do us. Now nah, what we do, you know? So you start blaming external forces yeah. without looking at the fact yeah, your exactly so. Yeah, exactly. So you're in this um, relationship with a woman as the time you got married. I'm mm -hmm. not going to go too much into detail, but um, there were um, the dynamics of that as around the time you got married seemed to um, seem to ins you know point to how within the, the within the LGBT community there seems to be this um, notion that same sex relationships aren't as serious as you know um, heterosexual relationships. You know that it's something that happens on the side of that happen that can happen in tandem with the heterosexual relationship and all of those things. You know and it's not something we fight for. Yes, oh, it's, it's, well, yes it's, it's just you know it, when, when you put it on a on a scale with a heterosexual relationship, it's like the heterosexual relationship is completely out to it. Right. So, um, coming from that place to where you are now, what would you say? And basically, this is like what I'm really asking is, what advice would you give to people who are still in that place, right? What would you have said to that young girl you were at that point if you could, from where you are right now? Well, um, <clears throat> if I were talking to myself, yeah. Uh, my younger self now. <clears throat> I think what I would say is it's not worth it. And it's not going to end well. It never ends well, as a matter of fact. Um, so if it's not going anywhere and it's not ending well, then. Why are you going back from it? What's the point? Yeah. And usually what happens is somebody gets found out. And then it gets complicated. Then you start having, so on both sides, you have a relationship problem in marriage. Then somebody will now want to out you. Then there's blackmail. Then there's, you know, it just gets really complicated. And your life in general can be really complicated. Yeah. And it's just, it's just not, not worth it. So if I were to talk to myself, my young self, younger self, then that's what I would say. I just quickly about like okay, um, what if, what if, let's say we're having a conversation with this younger self. In light of you saying it's not what it's, mm -hmm. what if because right whenever we whenever we are in whenever we're surrounded by situations we can we hardly have the patience to think about the long run. We are too overwhelmed Inside. by what yeah what's oh, happening at the moment. You know so now. Let's just say there's a, a, a reality that has you talking to her and she's saying, she's citing um, issues like what people would say, what family would say, what everybody would start saying, you know, the, the whole um, talk yeah. back and forth of people around her at that moment, but you know that in the long run it's not worth it, but this is her present reality. So. How would you, what would you then say to her? Right, I mean, and those are real concerns, right? Yeah, those are real valid concerns. So yeah. definitely I'd listen. Um, uh, but listen, but at the end of the day, you know, um, I think that it would be important for me to point out to, to my younger self that the cost of what people will say now versus the cost of what you have uh, versus the cost of you being outside in the future sure. yeah. i mean you can't compare no. do you understand yeah. it's easier in my in my opinion and in my experience it's easier to before the wedding say okay oh, that is if if that's the reality if you've come to that realization because at that time, I hadn't come to that realization yeah, yet, right? So, if you've come to that realization, or maybe for whatever reason you decide not to get married, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to let your family down by not getting married. Um. <laughs> because the way they will be um. when they. <laughs> Oh, they will start reading out all the things you, you will not, you will, See, it will be so terrible, you know. 
Um, so, so yeah, that's 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 what I'll say. I say, listen, you know, yeah, you in this thing is very difficult to see the end of the road, whatever. But trust me, experience has taught me that you know. I mean, if if I had known what I know now, then you know, <laughs> that big wedding we had. Yeah. The uh, the final thing I wanted to talk about was about um, economic privilege. Now, I had, I don't know if you remember, there was this um, BBC interview you gave, this was in Pigeon, and um, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. And that was the first time I actually saw you talk about you being a lesbian. And I don't know if it was the mental space I was in then, because I'm sure now I wouldn't be so shocked by it, but then I remember it so like, wait, what the, what did she do, what is going on here? Like, I, <laughs> I did, it was something I could not, un, I could not wrap my head around. I mean, I know, I, I, that, I was, prior to that time, I started to share all these um, notions that you can't be queer, you can't affirm your, your sexuality and live in Nigeria. But still, there was a certain sense of, but still it has to be in certain circles, in certain communities, just don't say out, you know, out there. And then to hear you say that, it was actually, it shocked me, then it started me out of my sense of, but you know what, why if she, if she can do this, why aren't you doing it? It was sort of inspirational, you know, so but yeah. Um, but then I was wondering, I, let, I, I allowed room for the thoughts that could it perhaps be because there was, certain, there was a certain privilege we were operating from, a certain status, a certain position you have, have acquired in life that, and allowed you to, you know, be able to just say or be able to just affirm your sexuality like that in life and in Nigeria right here. It's, what made you feel like you could be you in Nigeria? What, what's, where was it coming from? Where was this boldness coming from? I suppose, I, I don't know if... I mean, this economic status people keep talking about, but I, I want to know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> because me, I'm just hosting like everybody else. You get, like, I'm not... Or maybe, okay, or in, in addition to that, like, or maybe what, like, I also wanted to like. Was it maybe it wasn't like the privilege of um, economy? Like maybe it was like how much contribution did your ability to travel and experience other cultures where life is free and there? How much impact did it have on you being you? I suppose this. Well, um, I think that was the only thing okay so let me go back to 20 2012 2012 2013 right 2012 2013 2014 before i came back in 2014 so i started being more vocal after i came out to my family which was in 2012 and by being vocal, I mean talking about it in on social media, on Facebook. Okay, so you understand? <laughs> and at that time, um, I wasn't back in Nigeria one, but I knew that I was going to come back. Uh, so I eventually came back in 2014, and then I just continued from where I stopped. I didn't know anybody then. I wasn't part of the movement. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't know. I didn't know the community. I didn't even know we had one. I didn't know any. I was. I had just moved from Yankee Street to Lagos, just to start this job, right? So, I wasn't coming from a place of oh my godfather or my godmother or my this or that or have. I didn't have one big backing somewhere. <coughs> In fact, when I came out to my family, right, I was still living at home. I didn't, I didn't have a job. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like I didn't, I didn't have a job. I didn't have money of my own. But I just, I guess, to the to, to answer the question that you're asking, I guess maybe because I 
I'm very well traveled. I have seen that there is life, yeah. that there can be life after coming out. And even if you encounter difficulties when you come out, that it does get better. And that it, it doesn't just stop there. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? There will be difficulties, as is with anything that is valuable in, in life. You will always find one or two issues here and there. But I even stop because it gets. So, so for me, I think that is what sort of also helped me to to not care about the immediate discomforts that I was experiencing. I, I think that I, I had a, a more long-term view of what I was doing, why I was doing it, and of course I knew that it needed to be done. And I didn't really see anybody doing it, so... So, on a final question, um, what are your hopes for this documentary? Well, you know, the, the um, I think for me, it's really to, the very first thing is to inspire other people to share their stories, because I think that it's so powerful. And, you know, it's like the very thing that we fear is what is going to give us liberation at the end of the day. Yes. And so, but it's always very difficult to, to, um, for people's minds to grasp that when they're struggling, yeah. you know, but that's it. But it doesn't change the fact that that is what is true, and we've seen it play out multiple times, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, so my my number one goal is to encourage and inspire other people to speak to see that it can be done, and your life can continue, and you can even open opportunities for you mm -hmm. that you probably didn't consider, right? Yeah, of course, I want everybody to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> I want people to watch it, and I want, um, and, and, and I hope that it touches people, you know, and it leads to greater acceptance. Okay. So, yeah. is the documentary going to be available for public consumption at the point? Maybe? Yes, it will. We're, we're going to host it on, its, on the film website. Okay. Um, uh, where you'll be able to watch it. Not for free, though, okay. because. Um, the funds that will be used, that will be gotten from that, will yeah. be used to fund other projects, other okay. film projects. Um, so, not, not for free, but for now, there will be screenings. Okay. Uh, multiple screenings that will be organized subsequently, so that people can see for free. So, yeah. um, thank you thank very, very much for, for, you know, letting us be a part of this journey of yours in bringing us um, allowing us to be part of the screening and allowing us, allowing us into your space and for this interview as well for opening us so it's, it's, it's something to be grateful for thank, thank you. you thank you so that's actually for today as you're coming with next time i'm cheating you and i'm welcome and i'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>